Hello, this is Pushing Boundaries, a podcast about pioneering research, breakthrough discoveries, and unconventional ideas. I'm your host, Dr. Thomas R. Verney. My guest today is Dr. Paul Valent, psychiatrist, lecturer at Monash University, co-founder and past president of the Australian Society for Traumatic Stress Studies, and of the Child Survivors of the Holocaust Group in Melbourne, Australia. In the course of his work, he has told me, he has come to understand the close interactions between mind, body, and society, and how trauma disrupts all these aspects. Dr. Vallant is the author of eight books, and his most recent one, I think, well, he has got two recent ones. One is about mental health in the time of the pandemic. Have I got that right, Paul? Yes. yes. And the yes. other one is in, 19, uh, in 2020, child survivors, adults living with childhood trauma. Correct? Okay. Wow. Welcome, Paul. If you want to correct me on anything, go ahead. Um, okay, so um, my my book previous to the pandemic one is called The Heart of Violence, Why People Are Aggressive and Violent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I'd just like to mention that book. Yes, I see it. Yes, okay, I, I've got that as one of your eight books. Yes, The Heart of Violence. So was that the last one that you published? Yeah, before the pandemic one, yeah. Pandemic one, okay. So in Child Survivors, adults living with childhood trauma, you recount 10 child survivors' stories. Their experiences range from living in hiding to physical and sexual abuse. The stories in this book contribute to questions, and this is what I would like to talk about today, questions concerning the roots of morality, memory, resilience, and specific scientific queries of the origins of psychosomatic symptoms, psychiatric illness, and the transgenerational transmission of trauma. So uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of trauma, uh, what got you interested in, in this subject to start with? Um, yeah, uh, it's a long story, I suppose, but it uh, can be shortened in the sense that my life was um, interrupted by a major trauma, which you and I have shared, actually. Yes. Um, that's the Holocaust. Yes. Uh, now, for a long time, of course, I did not realize that to what extent that has affected me and, to, in fact, to what extent other people have been affected by traumatic events. So it's been a long journey, um, but I guess the one that um, really brought it home to me is when I actually observed people experiencing trauma. Uh, and that was in the 1983 bushfires uh, in Victoria. And um, it was there that um, people showed an amazing variety of uh, responses, as you mentioned, you know, biological, psychological, social. Um, and, and there it was, you know, in totally open way, which I couldn't uh, deny or you know, it was blatant and it was in your face. Mm -hmm. Not that everybody saw it that way. Uh, people were quite defended uh, and other people were just, just look for psychiatric illnesses, which they didn't find. But boy, there were people who were very um, distressed. So the question was, what was this distress? Because it wasn't really psychiatric illness. Uh, and that led me to the concepts of uh, well, stress and trauma. Um, and... Uh, well, I don't know how much you want me to go into it now, but um, I realized that people responded in many different ways. Uh, and they all had to do with some 
way of surviving. Uh, and yeah, and there were biological, psychological and social uh, responses. I mean, and uh, people went to their GPs in droves. They were overwhelmed. The other interesting thing, Thomas, was that um, about uh, three, four days after the bushfires, um, people stopped talking <laughs> somehow. I mean, the bushfires certainly pervaded their lives. But instead of um, talking about their experience in the bushfires, they started to talk about uh, palpitations, um, headache, neck ache, all sorts of aches, tension aches, as you could see, and, and many other symptoms and even illnesses. Um, so that was a very major step in my um, acknowledgement or experience or maybe re-experience of trauma and that set me really thinking <laughs> hard and as you mentioned at the same time or around the same time I started to I was discovered um, at a conference uh, and I think you were there at the same conference um, by Sarah Moskowitz in the lift uh, as a child survivor of the Holocaust uh, and she asked me if I was going to this meeting of child survivors, and I said, oh, I'm not a child survivor. Um, and she asked me, when were you born? Where were you? She said, you're a child survivor. Come to the meeting. Uh, at the same time, I started to discover child, sur child survivors and myself, okay? And, and these two major experiences conjoined and... Um, yeah, and, and I formed a group, and then soon after that, I wrote that book um, that you mentioned, Child Survivors of the Holocaust. Now, have you seen in your practice uh, the children of the children of Holocaust survivors? In other words, people who were born after 1945? Uh, yes, I had. Um, yes, quite a few. And um, it's one of the most interesting things um, of how one inherits the Holocaust. That's what I'm interested in. Can you talk about that a little bit, please? Um, before I do, i just like to mention, because we often get forgotten um, that uh, there are also child survivors of the Holocaust. In other words, they like us, who um, were both survivors, but also children of survivors, okay? So we're the one and a half generation, if you like. But with regard to your question of uh, how is the Holocaust transmitted? Yes, the second, um, yes. Uh, it's, um, it's transmitted in every way. Um, it's transmitted biologically, psychologically, socially. Um, if you have a parent who is engrossed in uh, his or her uh, experience and sees the Holocaust as the life experience, the motivating actor in life and sees the child sometimes as a replacement child for a child that's been killed in the Holocaust. That happened often. Or sometimes as a way of negating or trying to negate the Holocaust, but always worried that the Holocaust will embroil this child. So this child picks up all these cues in different ways and sees uh, for no apparent reason to the child um, danger everywhere or sees itself as very vulnerable or sees itself as sickly or um, or depressed and maybe you know because the way to communicate with the parent is through being sad or depressed itself um, so it's a it's an all enveloping really 
uh, way of transmission. And remember, it's transmitted from birth. And well, maybe, as you would say, before birth. I would. You know, I'm sure it is, actually. <laughs> I'm sure you're right. <laughs> yes. So then uh, we, we come to um, your treatment of these um, traumatized people. And um, I, I, I think that you wrote one book um, which had to do with your particular approach to, um, to trauma victims. Um, I think you have a particular way of dealing with them. Can you describe that? Well, um, yeah, it's in the book, Trauma and Fulfillment and Therapy. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think the first step uh, in treatment is to recognize uh, that there is something wrong. And uh, that's not a small step, actually. It's a huge step. Mm -hmm. um, because as I mentioned to you, I didn't realize uh, at this conference, which was, I was already <laughs> well adult and well into psychiatry, I did not recognize that I was um, a child survivor myself and with everything that that implied. Uh, so recognition is uh, very much the first step. Yes. The next one is um, what we might call generically supportive therapy. But what does it mean? It means that um, you maybe meet others uh, who speak your language, who, so for instance, at this um, uh, the Hidden Child Conference, which was the first international conference of child survivors, there were a thousand, 1100 actually child survivors. You were there, I think. <laughs> yes. uh, I met you after many years. Anyhow, um, it was a totally amazing experience because having been like a sore thumb in the general community, suddenly I was with 1,100 sore thumbs and uh, we formed a family and I could talk to anybody there and we understood each other and we spoke the same language. So, of course... Uh, and that's a very healing uh, situation, actually. Because, like in our group of child survivors, we told our stories, and we believed each other, and we empathised and sympathised with each other. And so, for the first time, stories were told, and stories were absorbed, and one could absorb one's own story. Okay, so this is. Um, a very broad and generic way of talking, of, you know, technically of supportive therapy. Um, and then there's insight, which is um, a bit more difficult, um, but it's uh, where you not only understand uh, uh, intellectually that, oh, okay, I've got this strange image uh, which oh yeah okay so now I understand that it came from the holocaust but to actually emotionally absorb it and uh, with us um, I'll, I'll talk maybe with charts of ours but second generation who you asked me about often do it with their parents they go or they have um, gone to the sites of where the parents or where the children themselves as we you know, actually suffered things. And we went back to those places and, and joined the intellectual insight. Oh, yeah, you know, I'm a child survivor and I've got these symptoms. But to get real insight into how come and what it means and how you've experienced it emotionally and physically and uh, in your whole world. Uh, and so, so that was uh, a very important uh, aspect of, if you like, treatment. Um, and then um, resolution of, uh, well, what does it mean? What does it mean in terms of um, one's purpose in life? So it becomes 
a very, uh, you know, from the very biological to the very uh, aspect of what is mean, what is life's meaning after all, what is one, what is one's meaning in life and one's purpose in life. And what does one do and how does one uh, regenerate and, and generate children and how, and how do you deal with them? So in treatment, you have uh, these, I would say, major existential insights. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a big question that you asked. <laughs> uh, do you do you have found have you found that the parenting styles of the survivors of the Holocaust, like these are adults who survived the Holocaust, when they have children, is their parenting style in some ways different from non-Holocaust survivors? Oh yes, I would say so. Um, okay. uh, but you can't generalize. So, for instance, some parents uh, will talk of the Holocaust all the time, but they will not, funnily, no, not funnily, but they would not talk about the actual traumas. Uh, they would talk around those traumas. And so the children would certainly be imbued with the Holocaust, but there would always be a mystery so, for instance, um, a parent might not uh, tell the child that you know it's a replacement child. Not that even the parent would think that way, you know, but unconsciously it might that he might or she might that this child is a, a replacement or an attempt to replace previous children, which of course is impossible, but it's problematic when it is attempted. So, but this parent might nevertheless talk to the child continually about the Holocaust. Other parents would totally not talk about the Holocaust um, because they would want to protect the children from um, from their experience. Uh, my parents, well, my father was a bit like that. Um, he lost eight siblings. It was one of nine and the other eight were killed. And uh, he never talked about it, but he demonstrated it by, for instance, eating very fast uh, because it signified starvation, you know, uh, lack of food during the war. Um, and unfortunately, I think he died of it because uh, he had cancer of the stomach. Mm. Um, yeah, so, um, sorry, I got diverted and I've lost the question now. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Um, so in, in terms of, um, uh, in terms of resilience, um, have you made any observations as to what sort of characteristics help people um, deal with these traumas? Like, are some people better at it than others? I hate the term resilience, I'm sorry to say. I know that it's uh, an in vogue term. Mm -hmm. um, as long as you're alive, you're resilient because, you know, whatever is bothering you, you're, you're still fighting it. Um, Holocaust survivors will tell you that um, there wasn't anything that they did that allowed them to survive, that it was mainly luck. Well, uh, I think there's more to it as well. I think that they had to strive very, very hard right. um, to survive. Um, I haven't found... Uh, well, there were very different ways of surviving. And you were lucky, I think, if you were able to do that, you know, if you were chosen, you know, to be uh, a person um, distributing food, so you, you were able to feed yourself. Or you were lucky if um, 
you found a group, um, uh, Katie Freed, about her, whom I wrote. Mm -hmm. um, she was uh, just an ordinary little, you know, uh, uh, a child from a reasonably well-to-do family, but she had no great strengths, but she found strength in a group that she joined or who took care of her. Um, it always helped to know somebody, uh, to have some connections, but mainly really to use your survival strategies, uh, you know, which I described. That's one of the things I'm proud of, that uh, I did find that there are actually words that can describe traumatic situations and traumas and the uh, dispersion of trauma through one's person and um, how one deals with trauma, whether again, biologically, psychologically or socially, is a matter of luck, you know, whether you get TB and um, tuberculosis and whether you survive it or not, you know, <laughs> yeah. It's a good luck and uh, and and you know some in some intelligence ability to plan ahead, get along with people, interpersonal skills are very important. Well, yes, Thomas, uh, they are, they are, uh, and yet sometimes people survive by being selfish and uh, um, taking from other people and stealing and robbing. I'm not saying that was general, but there are different ways of being able to survive at different times. Yeah. I, I know somebody, for instance, who survived by um, digging into the livers of dead people. In, this is in a concentration camp. Um, and... Um, of course, that was forbidden. You know, if you, if you were found out to uh, to be a cannibal, <laughs> um, you were you were killed. But he managed to actually survive physically reasonably well, not all that well, because he then developed tuberculosis. But anyway, he survived by eating um, the part of the flesh part of. of who had died. He ate the flesh of dead people? Yes. Uh, but he, he seemed to know something about um, uh, nourishment because he actually dug into their livers and he believed that the liver, that livers were very nourishing, which in fact they are. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, he ate <laughs> dead people's livers. Yeah. So I mean, he's unique. I don't think anybody else <laughs> has done that. Um, what about well, others have cannibalized, but yes. But may, yeah. may I ask you, uh, where did you, how did you survive the war? Well, um, my parents uh, crossed the border you know, from Slovakia to Hungary in 1942 uh, i think it was april or may and um, it was a time when jews were uh, uh, in slovakia itself were sent to concentration camps they were the first to be sent to auschwitz um, <clears throat> so we were lucky in the sense that as i've mentioned my father's family, all of them, lived in the country and uh, people were first selected from the countryside. So he realised that the writing was on the wall and so, yeah, we, we crossed the border illegally to Hungary. They were then caught soon after. Mm. Um, but they negotiated with the and I'm now talking, if you talk trauma, this is my trauma, okay? Um, so uh, here we are in the street in Pannonia Utsa, uh, Pannonia Street. 
sunshine, you know, just a normal day. But two people in trench coats approach my parents and they talk. Uh, and in retrospect, they negotiated to leave me and not because they were, in fact, they were arrested by these uh, Hungarian Nazis. Um, and they said that they were going to get some ice cream with these gentlemen. And I knew that there was an ice cream shop and I sort of thought, that, yeah, okay. Um, but I was left there. Uh, and that was my major trauma. Um, uh, then what happened? Then there was a gap in memory. But I do remember that my uncle, who must have been notified that what happened, collected me and uh, took me to the family farm. And I was there until my parents, and here's another unique situation. I don't, I've never heard of this situation before or since. Uh, and that is that they were uh, on, the, on a train um, to Auschwitz. And in the last stop before Auschwitz, they were, they heard their names being called. Yes. Uh, and they said, here we are, here we are. And they were hauled out of the, um, the death trains. Uh, well, it was bribery. Um, <clears throat> my uncle um, realized where they were and they bribed the guards and got them off the train. Would you believe it? I've never, uh, never. Yeah, yeah. And eventually they made their way back again to Hungary uh, and collected me from the farm, which at that time was in Hungary. Uh, and then we lived as Aryans, uh, like Christians. And this again, I mean, you know, other people did that, but it was relatively very unusual. And Luckily, um, I imagine that people in the building um, suspected something, I don't know. But people in those days, either they denounced you or they didn't talk about it. So luckily, they didn't talk about it. And so we survived um, in that particular building where we were for about three years, generally hiding. I mean, it was called survival by hiding, but it was open hiding where uh, you actually went into the street and I remember going to the baths for instance um, which was just down the street and we were in open hiding my father and I in open hiding swimming in in this uh, in these baths Gelliet baths if you know um, which was uh, part of a hotel which was the uh, headquarters of the uh, the German Nazis, or the Nazis. And um, so we were right under their noses. So it was, a, <laughs> again, I didn't realize it at the time, of course, this was, I just enjoyed the waves in the, in the baths. Um, and um, yeah, so we, sort of, we survived the bombing. It was a, that part of Budapest was bombed for, for many weeks. Uh, about six weeks and then the Russians came and my father then declared to the Russians who we were and then we became the protectors of the people in the building uh, so I think we avoided the uh, major robberies and uh, rapes and so on uh, so that's how we survived yeah so um, now you are living in Australia you are married you have grown up children Yes, um, I'm blessed having <laughs> three children. Uh, we celebrated the middle one's 50th birthday by going to see Hamilton and <laughs> came for family dinner by a limousine. Uh, yeah, so that you know, was a very warm feeling about that. Um, have any of 
followed in your footsteps? Has any one of your children become a psychiatrist? They were all totally adamant that they would not become doctors and especially not psychiatrists. <laughs> all right. So what did they become? Um, the eldest, who is a very bright girl, um, she is a food journalist. And um, it's not that she didn't inherit things from me. Uh, <laughs> she did. So, for instance, during this pandemic, when a lot of uh, restaurateurs and waiters and uh, food workers were in dire straits, yes. um, she interviewed them. She interviewed over a thousand of them. Oh, my. And, yeah, and uh, has her own podcast, and she has a regular column in a major newspaper. Uh -huh. uh, and so she did her little bit of therapy with these people and uh, she was very central in their lives uh, and in in their lives being recorded and, uh, dis and uh, told to the general population. Um, yeah, she's a great, <laughs> oh, they're all great. <laughs> um, my, the middle one, who's the son, uh, Ariel, he, um, he's the one who turned 50 recently. Um, he works um, in a deprived area, um, look, uh, and he's um, head of uh, an organization that is looking for, that is giving providing services and um, and uh, organizes events uh, in the local community. Uh, the youngest one, Amy, is a musician. Um, and yeah. And they each have two daughters, so I have six granddaughters. Mm. <laughs> they're all they're all doing well. They each have all, all of them have their problems. Uh -huh. But happily they all live in Melbourne. We all meet uh, at our place every fortnight to have dinner and um, there's no strife as far as I know <laughs> between the siblings or, or the cousins. Um, you have, uh, thank you, thank you for sharing that. You have, uh, you also have a large ab Aboriginal population in Australia, right? Have you... Well, have you dealt with any of them in terms of the traumas that they have been subjected to uh, in the past? Um, I personally have not. Um, <laughs> uh, I used to believe that um, Melbourne had hardly any Aborigines, so you don't see full-blooded Aborigines in Melbourne, uh, not much, or, you know, I don't, and most people don't. Um, but now there was, of course, um, the same thing, you know, second generation, third, fourth generation, who uh, are usually mixed um, racially, but they claim Aboriginal status. Uh, so now there's more and more of them and they are seeking recognition more and more, and um, they are being recognised uh, actually more and more with the new government. Um, uh, there will be, well, there is recognition, but there will be political recognition of them, um, I think, following a referendum that is in train. Yeah. But it's interesting, Tom, because um, I do compare, I have often compared uh, them and us, and actually in the Holocaust Centre, we did meet with some Aborigines at different times and compared uh, similarities and differences. Yes. And what did you find? If anything, what what similarity? What, what... Uh, well, there, there's a huge difference, actually, uh, which set me thinking, and I don't know if I'm, if I'm right, but um, the Aborigines are 
have uh, have generally uh, suffered more. You know, they've been more um, splintered um, uh, uh, at the lowest rung of society, really, as far as uh, wealth or having made it, and they die earlier than um, uh, the white population. So they are very continued traumatized and self-traumatizing because they suffer a lot of domestic violence and alcoholism. Um, <clears throat> so that's one area. The, uh, in contrast, um, the Jews and Holocaust survivors have done well in Australia. Um, a lot of them are quite wealthy. They you can't totally generalize because a lot of them also have suffered and uh, continue suffering and also died earlier um, than the rest of the population. But the ones who are still surviving, um, I would say they are um, reasonably well assimilated into general society, uh, are often leaders in the society and certainly uh, done re pretty well financially, I would say. And so the question is why? Why this difference? Um, I think um, I've often compared myself uh, to, to sexually abused, actually. Uh, and I've written a paper on comparing Holocaust survivors to sexually abused survivors. And I think that where I and others have had it well is that our parents loved us and were able to, uh, to some extent or some time, um, give us that love. So, for instance, I was very lucky because my, my parents loved me and I was lucky that I was actually with them during the Holocaust in the main and afterwards. Uh, so I had no hesitation in thinking that they loved me and they would have sacrificed for me. So even though Holocaust survivors were broken up familiar, family-wise, nevertheless, the feeling yes. of family love uh, was there and they carried it. Yes. And they carried it were able to carry it sufficiently for a sufficient length of time uh, and then reconstitute after the Holocaust sufficiently um, and and they had the education I guess as well and they, str they strove for the education uh, and that was somehow different to uh, the Aborigines we call them indigenous people now um, where somehow the abuse continued and uh, continued over generations. Uh, I think they, in a way, had it bad. And it was the same with the sexually abused, which is interesting. Uh, see, there, often the people who would have loved them and should have loved them and could have loved them were the abusers. And... Um, how, how do you get over that? So I, I, in my comparison, I thought that in many cases, sexually abused children um, suffered, if you're going to compare, yes. suffered at least as much anyway as Holocaust children. It's a very interesting comparison. I've never heard of that before. That's very, very interesting. Um, are you are you working on a new book? <laughs> uh, Thomas, I am. Um, <laughs> I have to confess. <laughs> what is your new book? Um, what is it? Um, well, uh, it's an autobiography, um, but I must tell you, it's not like uh, you know, telling my life story, but uh, as if my life story was all that important. Um, but what I have found was that people don't quite understand 
what I'm at. And um, for instance, you know, I, I've developed the concept of eight survival strategies and their biological, psychological and social aspects radiating into uh, body, mind and society. Um, <clears throat> but I, I find that people find it difficult to go beyond yes or no, or black or white. Um, uh, and I think that um, to some extent that is uh, anatomically uh, determined by a hemispheric division where we basically are not aware of the workings of our right hemispheres of the brain I'm talking about. So what I want to do is to involve people in my in my story and other stories and explain um, what I've uh, learned scientifically uh, in a way that they can absorb and they would be interested to absorb. So uh, that, that's my major and probably last <laughs> major endeavor. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Nice to see a smile, Thomas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. For, for whoever um, is listening to this, you should know that Thomas and I were best friends back in Slovakia after the war. After the war, yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. Still, it still resonates. And when I look, look at your face, it still resonates. <laughs> yes. Yes. I feel. I feel kind of sad talking to you because it's all kind of coming back and, uh, you know, all the suffering that we have been through. I'm wondering, how about you? Like when you see survivors or the children of survivors, how does it affect you? Um Well, uh, I must say, uh, it affected me, well, it affects me, I mean, obviously, to anybody with whom I'm empathic yes. and sympathetic, I'm affected by their stories, and, but I somehow um, managed to make the best of it. Uh, and that book, Child Survivors of the Holocaust, mm -hmm. is a reflection of it. And also having established the Child Survivors group. Mm -hmm. um, and it's as if through those efforts, sort of, and also my personal efforts, and also through therapy and psychoanalysis and so on. So, you know, it was quite a major enterprise. But something came off it, you know, and um, I think I, I wouldn't advise anybody to go through what I went through and what you went through. But having gone through it, um, I think I made the best that I could, I think, the best I could. Uh, and through that, I was able to help other people. And I was able to conceptualize something of the children's suffering uh, and and also then take it to other traumatic situations. So I feel somehow fulfilled with that. But what really bothers me is um, uh, the potential repetition of, and maybe worse, yes. of um, what's around. Um, because I think <laughs> Putin says that um, uh, you know that, that uh, Ukrainians are Nazis and that you know we're, we're still in, in the Second World War uh, or still reverberating with it. But unfortunately, uh, he's forgetting it. He's forgetting the Second World War, and he's not just he, but yeah, there might. <laughs> there are a number of catastrophes that are uh, hanging over us, um, and uh, you know, with uh, climate change, with uh, nuclear proliferation, 
with just war again. Uh, yeah, that's what uh, bothers me. And um, Thomas, uh, if I think about, well, what have I contributed to negating all that, which is what I really always wanted to do to stop this thing repeating itself. And that was my desire from the age of nine. I remember thinking that I don't want this to happen again to any, any other children or to anybody else, really. And I started to write at the age of nine. But now, at, a, at my age, uh, 84, 5, what have I achieved and how much have, has the world got better through my efforts? And that's a bit despairing. And that's, uh, I think, I'm sort of connecting with your sadness that, at that level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, at the end of my podcast, I usually ask one final question, which is, what's the most important thing you have learned in your life? Boy. I know, it's a big one. Well, I'll tell you what. Last night, yes. um, I was on another podcast, or not podcast, but a Zoom, um, with our Psychotherapy Association. And um, one of our members uh, has been instrumental in forming a group to deal with um, the climate change. Uh, and we were talking about, well, what has he achieved? What have uh, others achieved uh, broadcasting um, the terrors and horrors of uh, what's happening to the world? Uh, and um, we were, think we're talking about well, what, is, what is the antidote, as it were, um, to the denial, to to the underlying despair. And we were talking about the current younger generation who are much more aware of this. And, and uh, the, there was a survey done here recently about the younger generation and their attitudes to the future. And the majority were actually um, either despairing or depressed. <laughs> um, the, the others were in denial. So, <laughs> Um, I, um, I suggested that there's only, oh, what, what can, what can you say? What can you, where's the hope? All right. And I said, the hope is in love, which yeah. sounds very mushy and stupid and fatuous. But I think as much as anything, uh, so it's the love of life, it's the love of uh, people, it's the love of the next generation, it's the love of the environment, it's the love of uh, continuity. Uh, I think these are the, um, th that is what um, I think is the hope. The, the difficulty with that is that so many people cannot love. Yes. I don't think the Putin can love. But I'm not saying that he is beyond wanting love or needing love, uh, and I think that I think um, I think it is the light that one should follow um, with regard to what we can do. Um, what is the lesson? Um, I've been totally lucky that my love has not been destroyed, and that I can love. It is often obscured, I must say, and I, and uh, well, my experience is still there. You know, it has not been eradicated, but I'm lucky enough to draw on my father's love and my mother's love, and uh, especially my wife's love, uh, who is the antidote to <laughs> to all that I experienced. Um, uh, not that she wasn't affected by the Second World War as well, but in a very different way. And, yeah, and, but in any case, she still 
is a very loving person. So I think um, that is my salvation, that I have loved enough. I've been loved enough and I can love enough to feel that um, there has been some meaning and purpose, but there's still something I still need to do. <laughs> That's where I'm at. <laughs> Thank you. In, yes. You. that's quite moving and and thank you for being so open um this was totally fascinating i wish we had more time perhaps some other time we'll talk again um where can people reach you 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 have a website i imagine i do have a website and please anything that i have written almost except for the very latest is in there um, go to www.paulvalent.com and um, that's the website. And also um, on, on Amazon, they can find your books, right? Uh, yes, they can find my books on Amazon and other outlets as well, um, Google and so on. Right, right. Yeah. And, and the, the latest... Um, it's a booklet, really. Uh, Mental health in the times of the pandemic um, is downloadable for free on uh, Google uh, and and Kindle. Kindle varies. Sometimes it's free, and sometimes you have to pay a couple of dollars. Thank you. My guest next week will be Professor Olga Guni of the National and Kapodistrian University of Athens in Greece. Uh, she's the prime organizer of the Prenatal Sciences Global Congress, which will take place this October. Uh, her main interest is connecting the academic world with the community, designing and implementing services that promote evolution of human consciousness, well-being, and so that's next week. And today, I want to thank you, Paul, for a wonderful wonderful uh, conversation, really enjoyed it. And uh, let's stay in touch, okay? Yeah, let's stay in touch, Thomas. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation and your own insights. Thank you, thank you, Paul. Take care, all the best to your family. And to you.